Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Walter. I'm one of the pastors here at Holmes Avenue. I want to thank you guys for joining us this morning. If you're a guest here, you'll find a connection card in front of you. We'd love for you guys to fill that out and let us know you're here. If you don't see one, please come see me. I'll be happy to get you one and make sure you can fill it out so we know you're here and we'll hear about what God is doing in your life. I'm going to begin with an opening prayer for us as we've been doing to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We'll also pray for one of our sister congregations, Portside Baptist Church and Pastor Hayden Jacobs today. As we're getting started, though, I want to draw our attention to a psalm that I was reading this morning that I think is relevant for us as we celebrate the ordinance of baptism today and celebrate just what God is doing in the midst of our world. It's Psalm 51, and I want to read a few verses. Verse 1 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. The writer of Psalm, the psalm is talking about their sin and what they've done that would separate them from God, that leads them to a position of needing mercy and forgiveness. They're broken, they're beaten, they're condemned, and they're desperate for something to heal them. And they write in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is the story of the gospel, that we were condemned in our sin, that we were broken in our trespasses and shame. God in his mercy interjected himself into our world, that he brought forgiveness to us if we would confess our sins, cry out to him that we've fallen short of his standard, and that he would make us white as snow, that he would purge our sins from us and create within us a new spirit, a new heart, make us a new creation. This is what we're celebrating today as we celebrate not only gathering together as a body, but the celebration of baptism, that someone has crossed from death to life, and we rejoice in that. So today as we celebrate this ordinance, as we're gathered together on the front lawn for this baptism, this isn't a moment for golf clapping and just quiet, yeah, this is a moment of celebration, of rejoicing. This is a moment where we see someone who is identified with Team Jesus and telling all the world that I'm walking with Christ. This is a day that requires shouting, singing, and dare I say it because we're Baptist, dancing. This is a day of celebration and praise. And so as we sing these songs today, as we worship through the study of the scriptures, let us keep this at the forefront of our hearts and minds that we're celebrating and rejoicing because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so if you would, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer today to prepare our hearts and minds for worship, to focus on this truth of the gospel. During this time, we'll have a few moments where we'll silently pray individually to confess our sins before the Lord, and then I'll pray over us and pray for Portside in our gathering. So if you would, would you go to the Lord with me? Bow your heads in prayer. Father, have mercy on us according to your steadfast love. Lord, as we confess our sins before you, we recognize that we've fallen short of the standard of perfection that you've set. And Lord, we confess that to you willingly with a humble, contrite heart that we are broken, condemned sinners in need of a Savior. And Lord, today we pray that we could confess our sin to you and find forgiveness to find mercy at the foot of the cross from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, today would you purge us with hyssop? Would you make us clean, to make us white as snow? Would you purify us and give us new hearts, new minds? Let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds, daily saturating our lives with the gospel. Father, may we focus in on you today and celebrate this gift of new life that we have been given. 
May we sing clearly these songs of worship, celebrating all that you've done for us. May we study the scripture so that we can conform our lives to the truth of the gospel found in the pages of these scriptures we'll read. Father, we pray these same things for Portside Baptists, that they would rejoice in you, that they would celebrate your goodness today. I pray for Pastor Hayden as he is even now beginning to lead his people in worship and studying the scriptures and preaching through these passages. May you allow him to speak boldly the very word of God to clearly articulate the gospel found in the text. May you let his people's hearts be open and receptive to the power of the gospel. And Father, would you bring redemption to be present among your people? Would you bring salvation today to those that are far from you? Father, let us rejoice in your presence and celebrate all that you've done for us. Let us come before you as eager children before our Father, celebrating and rejoicing that we have come home to our Father. Lord, would you bless us today? with an outpouring of your spirit to work in our hearts and minds to transform us into the people that you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you for all the things you've done for us. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand and worship with us? Our song of the month is a beautiful reminder that as we look to Jesus, as we reflect on who he is and what he has done for us, as we acknowledge who we are because of him, then the things of this earth will gr truly grow dim. I hope this song encourages you and calls you to turn your eyes to Jesus and that as you do, the things of this earth will grow dim in the light of his glory and grace. Thank you. 
Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you.
Father, Father, thank you for having us in your house at this time, Lord. Lord, in this morning, as Brother Brian brings us the message, Lord, we ask that you speak boldly through him the words that we need to hear at this time. Father, just want to thank you for all that you do for us. And Father, thank you so much for loving us. It's in your most precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Please have a seat. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time of worship this morning. I want to welcome everybody again. It's a good-looking crowd. Good to see everybody here this morning. And uh, as Pastor Walter said, it's a great day uh, as we are celebrating the ordinance of baptism today. And we will do that in just a few moments after our time of worship here. And uh, I want to welcome you. If I, I hadn't had a chance to say hey to you this morning, my name is Brian or, or even meet you yet. I'm one of the pastors here and I'm glad to have you here with us and, and welcome everybody that's joining us online this morning as well. Uh, I want to also bring to your attention, if you want to continue in the, in the art of uh, or the time of worship with us through giving, you can uh, at the conclusion of our worship gathering, or you can go to homesavenue.com forward slash give to do that uh, because of stuff going on still with COVID. You know, we're not passing the plate still right now, but you can do that as you leave today. Um, if this is your first time with us or the first time in a while, we have been journeying through the book of Acts uh, over the last several weeks. And by the way, if you don't have one yet and you want one, we do still have a few copies of the Acts journals that you can have and take with you to follow along, take your notes and all of that. You are welcome to those. They're right here by the piano. Uh, but as we've been journeying through this, we're taking the book of Acts over the next several, several months going into next year, and we're dividing it into many series uh, and looking at it in different areas of the book of Acts to see what God is doing in those. And in this specific mini-series that we're in right now, we are in the series Faith on Fire. And we've been looking at this through the lens of the early church and how it began. After Jesus tells them to be prepared, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon them. They're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. They are going to go forward. And we see, as we saw two weeks ago, the Holy Spirit has come upon them and then last week, Pastor Walter led us in the time of Peter's sermon beginning, at the beginning of that sermon. And we went through last week up until verse 21. And for today, we're going to begin in verse 22 today. And I've entitled the message today, Jesus Christ the Messiah. Jesus Christ the Messiah. Because at the turning point in this sermon, as Peter is proclaiming it, we see this point now where he has said the things that he said. He's referenced Joel. He's referenced these things, these God-promised things that Pastor Walter talked about last week. And now we're at the point where he references and he talks about Jesus himself, the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And we're going to see very specifically incredible things about Christ Jesus 
our Lord here today. And to do so, we first need to stand to honor the reading of God's word. So if you would, please open to Acts 2, starting in verse 22 with me. It'll be on the screen. Stand with me as we read the word of God. The word of the Lord says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God was sworn with, with him an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter that the re- and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you have done so far in this time of our gathered together. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you are now going to do through the proclamation of your word. Lord, I pray for the one proclaiming it, Lord, get me out of the way. Lord, may you speak and move in this time. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move through this place. Lord, that you would move through and speak to the hearts of the people in this room and those listening online. Father, if we are battling sin, Lord, I pray that we would repent of it and we would flee from it. Lord, if we need to confess things to you, I pray that we would confess them to you. Lord, if we are being disobedient and not stepping out in faith and trusting what you are calling us to, Lord, I pray that we would repent and step out and trust you. Lord, I even pray for one today, maybe that is here or listening online that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord. Father, may today be the day of salvation for that person. Have your way in this place, O Lord, we pray. Lord, I pray that you would have your way right now in the pulpit at Portside Baptist Church as Pastor Hayden is standing in the pulpit now. Do a powerful work through their gathering as well. We love you, Lord, and we bless you in the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For this passage today, we are going to see a very specific message about Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are going to see that he is the risen Messiah. We are going to see that he is the fulfillment of the scriptures. He has proven that he is Lord and he offers salvation to any who would repent and believe. So I want to encourage you, if you're taking notes, I hope you are. If you want to jot this down, the first note that you can put is that Jesus Christ is the risen Messiah. Jesus Christ is the risen Messiah again Verse 22 reads, 
Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. I'm going to stop there as Peter's going to continue his thought next in 23. But as we continue to look at the sermon, we see that Peter first says, men of Israel, hear these words. He's making sure that he draws them to the attention. Pay attention to what I'm about to say to you. This is very important, the words that are coming out of my mouth. Hear these words. In church, I would encourage you with this, not because it's Brian, but I would encourage you because I believe, just as Pastor Walter said last week, Isaiah 55, the word of the Lord does not return void. So brothers and sisters, hear these words of which are going to be said today that have already been read to you. Hear these words. We know from what we saw last week, specifically back in verse 16, that Peter has announced this age of fulfillment of Christ. And now he begins to summarize this story of Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says, these mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him. He had no need to explain any further. Because he referenced those signs and wonders because the people that are there listening, it's this, this recent remembering for them. It's this reminder, because they've seen these signs, they've seen these wonders. And Peter himself even says, in your midst as you yourselves know. It's proof to the people, the working that has been done among them by God through the power of the Spirit, through what Jesus has done. We can even see an example of this in Jesus' ministry, where he goes and he casts out a demon. And I want to reference to you in Luke eleven twenty. 20, he says, But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come among you. The kingdom of God had come among the people through Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus' coming was the proof that the kingdom had arrived, and it was serious business what was going on. It was serious business because Jesus had already conquered death. Jesus had already paid the penalty for all who would repent and believe. He had already defeated the grave when he resurrected on Easter Sunday. And now he's ascended to the right hand of God. You know, in these Jerusalem Jews, as they're hearing these things, they can recognize this fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Many that were there, they, they remember the things that they were taught as they grew up. They remember these scriptures. Peter himself says, as you yourselves know. It's this reminder. The scriptures proclaimed that one would come. The scriptures proclaimed that there would be a Messiah that would fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. You yourselves know who this is because it is the one who you gave to lawless men. It is the one that was innocent, that was killed, that died. Look at verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. He points to the gospel here and he ties those Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled. Now we can read this verse and we can say, now Peter, what are you saying? Are you saying that it's the Jews' fault that Jesus died? Are you saying that it's the Gentiles' fault, the ones that, that carried him to the cross and made him die on the cross? Whose fault is this? Or, or you're also saying that it was God's foreknowledge and his plan that this would happen. What is the answer, Peter? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Those Jews that are hearing this, it is their fault because they turned over Jesus, a fully innocent man, sinless Turned him over to the hands of lawless men. Yes, those Roman soldiers that beat him and flogged him and carried him out to the cross where he would die. Yes, it is their fault. But here's the beauty of it. It was all part of God's plan. It was all part of God's redemptive plan. It was all working according to his plan. We've talked about God's redemptive plan over and over and over. We talked about it from the fact that it began in the garden when sin entered the world. God still had a plan there in that moment. We've talked about it all this year leading up to now in August. When we were in the book of Leviticus, we talked about every time where blood was being shed on the altar to atone for sin. And ultimately, there would be one that would come where his perfect, spotless, precious blood would be poured out to redeem all of mankind's sins. That is Jesus Christ. That is the one whom Peter is proclaiming. 
It's all part of God's redemptive plan. We've referenced it time and time again here, but Genesis 3.15. God is in the garden. He has approached Adam and Eve. He has gone to them after they have sinned against him. And there in the garden to Adam and Eve, and there with Satan in the form of the serpent, he says these words, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The proto-evangelium, the first good news of the gospels mentioned in the Bible. It is the proof text to say, I have a redemptive plan. This does not surprise me. It does not catch me off guard that this has happened. Guess what? There is one that will come. It will come down the line. This one will crush your head, Satan. You will lose. I will put the enmity between you and the woman. I will make the way through my son. It ultimately goes down to Jesus and his finished work. Look at verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Although Jesus Christ was sentenced to death, an innocent man killed by the hands of lawless men, that earthly decision, that that earthly court, if you will, saying, hey, you are sinless, you're still going to the cross. We don't want him. Crucify him. We'll take Barabbas. Just do it. Make it happen. Even though that happened, it could not keep him in the grave. It could not keep him in the grave. He was not, it was not possible for him to be held by it. God raised him up. God loosened the pangs of death because it was not possible for Jesus to be held by it. The proto evangelium is fulfilled. The serpent's head has been crushed. Jesus resurrected. Jesus defeated the grave. You see, God ordained for Jesus to die on that old rugged cross of Calvary on Friday. But God also ordained for his beautiful son to defeat the grave and resurrect on Sunday. It's an act of God. It's one of those but God moments. It's one of those moments where we see it and we say, wow. It's one of those moments where we look and we say, that happened, but God intervened. It's one of those moments where you stop and you say, man, Jesus died on that cross, but God intervened and Jesus resurrected. It's one of the reasons why On the shirt that Kenora is wearing today when she's baptized, it says, but God. It's one of the reasons on front of the baptism, it says, but God. Because it references Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. It's that moment for anyone who is a follower of Jesus. You know, you recognize you are a sinner condemned for hell. But God intervened. Because of the finished work of the Messiah, his risen son. And you have been redeemed. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the risen Messiah. Secondly, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. In verses 25 and 28 through 28, Peter here references Psalm 16 verses 8 through 11. And according to Peter, much like he did in reference to Joel, the Joel text that we read last week, Peter did not just say that this is some cool coincidence or anything like that. He's pointing to the scriptures to make sure everybody understands this is the fulfillment of God's word, what happened to Jesus. Peter's saying that all along, this psalm of David was written by David, divinely inspired by God, to point directly to the one who would come via the Davidic line to die on Calvary's cross and resurrect, who would sit on the throne for all eternity. Peter's referencing this passage to tell those listening the scriptures are pointing to exactly what just took place. 
Within the last several weeks, these things have happened. Jesus died, but Jesus resurrected. And it was all pointing to what God said would happen. Look at 25. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. We look at this. And we look to the Lord, not with eyes of the flesh, but of the mind, continually being renewed by it because of what God has done in us. He's transformed us. Remember Romans 12, 2, being transformed continually by the renewing of our mind, always having the Lord set before us, always wanting to pursue him and, and be obedient to him. The Lord has promised that he is with us always, and therefore we will not be shaken. This text alone points to the grace of God. 26, therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. Not asking for hands, but those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, do you have times in your life where you stop and you reflect on what God has done for you and you say, man, my heart is glad. Man, my tongue wants to rejoice. My flesh will dwell in hope because of the promise of what we have through what Jesus has done. Look at 27. A powerful verse pointing to what I'm saying here about what Peter is referring to. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. This points to King Jesus. This points to the one who would come down that divinic line, the one who would be a son of David, if you will, that would come down through the line that will sit on the throne forever. Jesus even made it clear himself during his ministry that he was the fulfillment of the law, the fulfillment of the word. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Thanks be to God for that. 28. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness in your presence. That it's going to continue in a few moments when we see in these next few verses. But Peter's going to refer back to 27. And he's going to point to the fact that David is talking about the risen Messiah, King Jesus. But the reason I just wanted to, to pinpoint here and focus is because we see again another text where Scripture is confirming Scripture. Peter is saying this happened, and uh, David, excuse me, I was about to say Paul, <laughs> David proclaimed it. David prophesied about it years and years before this would happen Here's proof. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Number three, Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah. Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah. He's not just Savior. He is Lord. 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Peter says there, I say this with confidence. He is confident in it. Not just because it's something that he believes, but he also references the fact that David is dead. There is a tomb for David. He says there again in 29, with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and he was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. There's reference of it being in the south of the city. If you want to jot in your notes, you can put Nehemiah 3.16. You can put that for you to go and look at later. It's referenced there about David's tomb. Why did Peter need to say this? He was making a clear distinction of what David was saying there in 27. David was not talking about himself. David was talking about the Messiah that would come, that would die, that would resurrect. David, just like every other human being to ever live, had a death date. David, just like every single one of us, has a death date. The reality is that there is eternity. Where will we spend eternity? Will it be with Christ Jesus our Lord, the one who defeated sin and death 
and made the way for that to happen. We're separated from God for all eternity because we haven't placed our faith and trust in him. Verse 30. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. Let's stop there. What is this oath that was sworn to David? Why does Peter reference that? Why is that important? Well, in Psalm 132, 11, Scripture says, The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he would not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. Before David dies, God makes an oath to him. And when God makes an oath, it's serious business. He made an oath to him that one of your descendants will sit on the throne. And it's not just a temporary throne, people. It's an eternal throne. It's where King Jesus sits. And will sit for all days moving forward. Over and over and over again for all eternity. Permanently. 31. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. That he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. David foresaw, and he spoke about it. He wrote about it. 32, this Jesus, God raised up that all we, excuse me, that we all are witnesses. See, we can read 32, and we can go over it very quickly. Okay, yeah, I get that. I understand that. But 32 is very important. 32 is a very important verse. You see, it's the resurrection that is the hinge of the gospel. If Jesus doesn't resurrect, he dies on the cross, and that's it. If Jesus doesn't go from the cross to the grave and then resurrect from the grave, we're lost. We're doomed. There has to be the resurrection. There has to be a resurrection. Because Jesus is just another guy that just dies on the cross. There is no resurrection, but he's fully God. He's fully man. And he defeats sin and death, and he gets up on the third day. Peter makes sure to point out to the crowd that they are witnesses of this. This is critical, church. No other God, little g, has anybody that can proclaim or have anything written in their word that they've resurrected and they've had witnesses of it. Jesus Christ resurrected and there were people there to witness it. After Jesus resurrects, after some time, he comes to them and he spends time with them before he ascends before them. They were there and watched him ascend to heaven. They were witnesses of what had happened. It wasn't just a story that could just be told like a bedtime story. No, it's the truth. It's reality. It's life giving. 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. I just referenced it. Christ Jesus has ascended to heaven. He's exalted. He's at the right hand of God interceding on behalf of the saints and he will be there until the day God says go back. The Holy Spirit has come about is on them, it was promised, and it was delivered. What do you know? God keeps his promises. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that God keeps his promises. 34 and 35. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Peter gives reference again to another passage of Scripture in the Old Testament. I won't read it to you, but you can write it down. Psalm 110, 1. It's pretty much right there in the text for you. But Peter's referencing that there. And Peter states that David did not ascend into the heavens, but the son of David, down the Davidic line, Jesus did. 36. 
Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you've crucified. Peter ends his sermon by making this profound statement. It was God who made both Jesus Lord and Christ, the one whom you've crucified. The gospel's been proclaimed. It's been laid out for them. You know, we can sit there and we may feel all bowed up and feel like, man, yeah, he told you guys. But here's the reality. Our sin, our sin sent Jesus to that cross. It wasn't just those people. Our sin sent Jesus to that cross. Make him die the death that we should have died to take on the wrath of God in our place. Here's the beauty of it all, the last point. Jesus Christ redeems sinners. Jesus Christ redeems sinners. 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Can you imagine them in that moment hearing all this? Peter has just laid it out for them. And they were cut to the heart. It's overwhelming for them in that moment to hear these things. Out of anguish, out of, out of guilt. Hearing these things, they say, brothers, what shall we do? They were at a crossroads. They've heard what Jesus did for them and they're realizing the weight of their sin and their shame and their guilt. Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says in 38, and listen to this here in this place right now, church. Anyone here, anybody listening online that is not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are at that place right now and you are cut to the heart and you're saying, what shall I do? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They're cut to the heart. They feel the weight of their sin and their shame. You gotta imagine, it's just, that's heavy. But Peter throws the life preserver out. He says, guess what? You can be redeemed. You can be redeemed. Repent. He informs them of the need to repent of their sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ as He is the one who forgives sins. If they do this, they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that will come and indwell them. All of that time, they've listened to all of this. They've heard it all. They're cut to the heart. They feel the weight of it. They are hopeless. But God, but God yet again, interjects and provides a way for them. It makes me want to ask the question. And I know we're gathered together as the church. So when I say that, the assumption is everyone that gathers here in the church are Christians. We're all here. We're here for the purpose of, of worshiping and glorifying God. But the reality is that I don't know the hearts of the people in this room. Only God does. And the reality is there may be people in here that do not know Christ Jesus as Lord. And the reality is that many who have heard and neglected, that have never confessed Christ, there is eternity separated from God. So I want to ask the question, much like those people there in that moment. Are you worn down by the weight of your sin and your shame? Do you feel hopeless? Do you feel like you've gone too far and God wants nothing to do with you? If that's you, the beauty of the gospel is that the Lord's grace and mercy is new every single day. And it's available to any. Who would repent and believe? Any who would repent, realizing your sin, repenting of it, confessing it to God, doing a 180 and getting out of dodge from it. 
repenting and believing. And let me just make this clear. Just because you repent and confess of your sin and you come to faith in Christ, it doesn't mean that everything is a bed of roses moving forward. The life of a follower of Jesus is difficult. Matter of fact, suffering is promised. But the beauty of it all is that if you are saved and Christ Jesus is your Lord, you have confessed Him, you are following Him, when the times of suffering and pain and anguish come, He is there with you always. Continually. Praise God for that. 39. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. The promise of salvation was not just for those in that moment who heard Peter speak. It's available to their descendants, their descendants, their descendants, those who hear the gospel proclaimed in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And praise God, it was proclaimed to the ends of the earth because it made its way to North Charleston, South Carolina in 2021 where a crazy guy is proclaiming the gospel. And prayerfully, every single one of us are doing that in our daily lives. That's a whole other sermon on itself. If we're not, let's get on our face and repent and let's start telling the people around us that we love and we care for that are dying and going to hell that they need Jesus. Verse 40. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Peter just kept talking. He kept encouraging them. He kept pointing them to the gospel with many other words. And he says, save yourselves from this crooked generation. You mean to tell me that things were crazy around at that time too? Things are going to be crazy all the time until Jesus Christ comes back because of the sin that is in this world. But I want to point out something very, very important. Peter says there, save yourselves. Let's make it very clear. There's nothing you or I could ever do to save ourselves. Only Jesus' finished work saves us. What Peter is referencing there is, save yourselves, listen to what I've just told you, and repent and believe the one who died for you and defeated the grave. Save yourselves. Lastly, 41, listen to this. So those who received his word were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Get out of town. When Jesus ascended, there was about 120. Peter proclaims the gospel. And in his proclaiming the gospel, 3,000 souls came to know the Lord. Listen to me. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We must continually do this because God's told us to do this. But we must continually tell people the gospel always. Because faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. So that neighbor that you love, that you care for, that you're getting to know, that you know is far from Jesus as possible, but you're scared about harming the relationship by talking about the gospel, be bold and proclaim the gospel. That family member that is lost and desperately needs to hear the gospel, proclaim the gospel. That coworker that you know is going to make work really, really awkward if you begin to proclaim the gospel to them, as God gives you the opportunity, boldly proclaim the gospel. It is not your responsibility to save their souls. It is your responsibility to boldly proclaim the gospel. Faith comes from hearing. They've got to hear it. They've got to hear it. In conclusion, 
it just leads me to ask the question today. Has Jesus redeemed you? Have you experienced Jesus Christ, the Messiah? Has he saved your soul and he is your Lord? If he is, I say praise God, hallelujah. Are you walking in obedience to him? Brian, you ask the same questions all the time. Because I want to make sure that we're doing it. If you're here today and you say, man, I'm a follower of Jesus, or I, I made a profession of faith at one point, but to be honest, I've just kind of just gone through life just kind of by the wayside. Okay? I'm glad you're here. Repent and follow Jesus. And if you're here today or you're listening online and you say, man, that sounds awesome. There's something about that. There's something I want to know more about. And today may be the day of salvation for you and you need to talk to somebody. And the Lord can redeem you and save your soul. It takes a simple acknowledgement of knowing that you are a sinner and that God has redeemed you by Jesus' finished work. Confess that sin to him and acknowledge that Jesus Christ has defeated the grave and God resurrected him. You will be saved. You can be baptized. We will praise God for that. So I'm going to take a moment, as we always do at the end, and just ask for quiet reflection and prayer. Go before the Father right now, wherever you may be, and say, Lord, I've just heard your word proclaim. What is it that you are speaking to me? Maybe you know exactly what the Lord's been saying as I've been speaking. And maybe you need to listen. Whatever it is, I want you to do one thing. Walk in obedience. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then I'll pray. Father in heaven, we glorify you. Father, we worship you. Father, we come before you right now because of the finished work of Jesus, his defeat of sin and death and resurrection from the grave that we can even come before you right now as your redeemed children. And Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and I pray and I ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would continually move right now. Lord, that you would speak to hearts in this moment. Lord, no matter where the people in this room or online that are listening are in the examples that I've given, Lord, I pray, Lord, that if you are speaking and you are drawing near to them, Lord, that they would confess Christ Jesus as Lord whether it be for the first time or that they would continually move in obedience moving forward with their life. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way. Lord, as we move into this time of, of singing a, a well-known hymn that he is Lord, Lord, I pray that the words that come out of our mouth are not just sung to, to sing them because they're on a screen for us to sing and we're being led to sing them. But Lord, that the things that we say are truly what we mean. That yes, Lord, you are our Messiah. You are the one that has saved us. But you are our Lord. You are the one in whom we submit to. You are the one in whom we walk in obedience to. You are the one in whom we hear the call to proclaim the gospel and we do so without any worry or fear. Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing. 
Thank you, Lord, for what you will do. We know, Father, that you will do far more abundantly than we can ask or think. So, Lord, we just pray that your will would be done. We love you and we honor you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. I'll be seated for one moment. Kanara, uh, you come up here, please. Thomas, you want to come up the way? Come on, buddy. All right, guys. Y'all know Thomas, because Thomas has been here for a little while now as a member here at Holmes. This is his newly wife, Kanara. I had the joy of, yeah, y'all can clap for them. That's fine. <laughs> I had the joy and privilege of marrying them just a little bit ago. Man, it seems like it's been a couple of months now. I'm a little yeah. older. Well, pain for you, but good for him, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But um, Kanara is coming this morning as um, one to be baptized. She's going to be the one that we're going to baptize out here on the front lawn in just a few minutes. She's, she's professed Christ Jesus as Lord. She just never went forward with believer's baptism. So we're going to do that in just a few minutes. Um, but she also is coming forward for church membership in doing so. And so by uh, anybody here that's a member of Holmes Avenue, if you would, please raise your hand in support of that. If you would love to have her here as a member of our family, praise God. Any opposed? Good. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you, yeah, you made it. You're good. Here's what we're going to do. 
Uh, just a very quick announcement. Deacons, we're going to have our meeting at 3 o'clock today. We've got to talk about um, the new deacons that will be coming on, so please make plans for that. That's the only piece of business we have that we need to uh, announce for anybody right now. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going uh, to ask Walter if he would pray for us as we close out this service right now. And then those of you that are watching us online, hang tight. We're going to end the feed, and then we will turn on the feed again outside uh, when we get ready for the baptism service. So everybody here, I know it's hot. We won't be out there too long. We're going to go outside. We're going to be right there on the front lawn of the church. Uh, when I was out there just a little bit ago, the sun is casting a shadow of the building right over it. It's pretty comfortable still. Uh, so we're going to go out there, and we're going to celebrate, right? We're going to celebrate Kanara's baptism, and then um, you guys will be dismissed from there. I'll pray us out when we're out there. Um, but this is a good thing. This is awesome, what we're doing today with the baptism. I want to make you aware of one thing. Uh, Tammy Mincy is also one that wants to come forward for church membership, and she was also going to be baptized today, too. Uh, however, her mother passed away yesterday. And so uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask Walter if you'll pray for Tammy as well. Uh, we're going to remember Tammy in our prayers this week. Um, she is hopeful to be with us next week, and if she wants to, we will baptize her next Sunday. All right? Um, but I want to make this invitation out there to anybody as well. I've said it in the emails and all that, but if there's anybody here uh, that has newly professed Christ or has never gone forward with believer's baptism, talk to us. We would love to talk to you about that. We'd love to dunk you and celebrate what God's doing in your life. All right, let's pray. You guys bow your heads with me. Father, we are thankful for you today and for the spirit of Christ that you've given us that has brought redemption and salvation to us, that we get to celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. As we go forth to celebrate this ordinance of baptism, this is a visual symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection, that we are united with Christ in life and death. So, Father, let this be an encouragement. Let this be something that we desire to celebrate and proclaim to the world that we have redemption at hand through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we also want to pray for Tammy and for her family, Lord, of just the pain of losing a parent, something that many of us know well, Father. And we ask for your grace and mercy to be upon her. Let us comfort her. Let us walk with her. But most importantly, Father, may you and your spirit be there. May you guide them and direct them, encourage them, and bring them peace in the midst of this time. Father, we are grateful for you and all that you're doing in this world. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. We love you guys. We'll see you outside in a few minutes.